To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, check out gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. One of the superpowers of computing is that you can code basically anything, whether it's a digital recipe book for all of your favorite lasagnas, or a video game where you're the mayor of an island of animal friends. But we can also use computing to mimic the real complex systems in our world. In other words, we can create simulations. And sure, there are life and murder simulator games, like The Sims, that you can play for the heck of it, but many computer programs that simulate something are used to make predictions, calculations, or decisions about high-stakes situations. So, in the final episode of our series, we'll bring together all of the tools we've learned to create an in-depth simulation of our old friends, the radioactive mice. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. Previously on the Radioactive Mouse Dilemma, a nuclear disaster releases dangerous radioactive materials, which obviously affects anything that lives nearby. And as we explored throughout this series, we can model the behavior and health of small animals like mice that have been exposed using code, after making a few simplifications. Radioactive materials decay exponentially, and some of them can stay radioactive for a very long time. So we basically modeled three scenarios. First, if a mouse is barely exposed to to any radiation, it keeps running around like nothing happened. Second, if a mouse is exposed to too much radiation, I guess it's gonna be eating the big old cheese wheel in the sky. And third, if a mouse is exposed to a not quite fatal dose of radiation, it could spread that radioactive material even farther as it runs around and poops or gets eaten, which is bad. Heads up also, I am going to be saying poop a lot in this episode because our producer has decided it's a funny word. Now, in past versions of this model, we've used variables and methods to represent aspects of our radioactive mice, but we didn't capture a lot of what makes a mouse a mouse. Object-oriented programming lets us organize those abstract elements into classes, which makes it much easier to wrap our brains around what's going on. Once we have these classes created, we can instantiate as many objects as we need to model different scenarios and do some data analysis. Basically, we'll focus on the behavior of a mouse moving around its environment that's been exposed to radiation. The key nouns in that statement, the mouse and the environment, hint at the classes we'll want to create, and the verbs like eat, sleep, move, and poop will become our instance methods, what we want our objects to do. To define our mouse class, first we need to ask ourselves what a radioactive mouse needs to know, which will become our instance variables. So we need our mouse objects to know where they are in their environment, so we can keep track of where they might be exposed to radiation and where they might spread radioactive material around. To keep things pretty simple, we can think of our environment as a 2D plane, with X and Y coordinates that describe something's location. We also need each mouse object to keep track of how much radiation it's been exposed to, and whether or not it's alive. And that's a good thing to check on every once in a while. Like, am I alive? There it is. We're good! To instantiate mouse objects in Java, we need a constructor method like always. We set default values for some of these instance variables as part of defining the class, like starting their radiation exposure at 0.0. .0. So the only parameter that we'll need to specify when we instantiate a new mouse object is an environment object. But within our constructor method, we can also give each mouse object a random starting place in the environment using math.random and some basic multiplication. This is exciting, all of the pieces are coming together. Now, after the all-important constructor method, we need to ask ourselves what a radioactive mouse needs to do in our simulation, which will become our instance methods. There are a bunch of different things that each radioactive mouse could be doing. Sleeping, eating, pooping, cooking lasagna, and moving. But to do any of those things, a mouse has to be alive. So the first instance method we're actually going to code will check whether or not the mouse got a fatal amount of radiation exposure. If the mouse has gotten a fatal dose, it dies, and its alive boolean is changed to false. Rip and peace, you spicy little guy. Plus, all of the radioactive material in its body is released at its current location. If our radioactive mouse is still alive, it can take an action, which is why we call this method act. Real mice make lots of decisions that can't be easily captured with math, or at least in the time we have in this episode. So we're going to lean into spontaneity here. We'll use math.random again to generate a random number, and then we'll use that number to choose whether a mouse eats, sleeps, moves, or poops based on a 
series of if and else statements. The sleep, eat, and poop methods are just different ways to update our mouse's radiation level, depending on what radioactive material is nearby and what kind of bodily function we're talking about. Like, is it snacking on radioactive plants or bugs, or pooping out radioactive waste? And the move method builds on the simplified Brownian motion model we used before, using math.random to generate a random distance for the mouse to travel. We also have a few if statements to make sure that our mouse won't venture outside of the boundaries of its environment. And speaking of those boundaries, the other important class we need to define is our environment class. Instead of trying to squeeze all this environment-related code into our main method, we can instantiate new environment objects whenever we want to simulate somewhere different. We actually already set up our mouse class to take an environment object as a parameter. In the mouse class, we're tracking how much radiation each mouse has been exposed to, but all that exposure has to happen somewhere in their environment. So when we're thinking about how to define our environment class, there are a couple of instance variables that we'll need to include. To create the boundaries of each environment, we need the width and length of the 2D plane. And to irradiate our mice, we also need the site of our nuclear disaster, or at least a pile of radioactive material for the mouse objects to interact with. In the spirit of simplicity, let's just drop a bunch of radioactive material in the center of each new environment object that gets created. Compared to our mouse objects, which need to scurry around and do rodent things, our environment objects mostly just have to keep track of where radioactive material is and how much of it is there. So our instance methods will update the radiation level at each point in the environment as mice eat or poop radioactive material. Since we have the radiation level of every point in each environment object, we can also do something really cool right inside of our program. We can visualize our environment with a map made of symbols. Here's the basic idea. We could take all of the points that have a radiation level between 1 and 2 and represent them with a dash, and assign different ranges of radiation levels to different symbols, like a plus sign, an asterisk, or an octothorp, which is the objectively funnier way of saying hashtag. We need one method, which we'll name getSymbol, to assign all these map-making symbols to their radiation ranges. And then we need another method, which we'll name printEnvironment, to loop through all of the points in our environment and print them out. But to see this in action, we actually have to run our simulation. And we do that in the main method, where all the moving parts of our program come together. It's time! To start, we need to instantiate a new environment object and a new mouse object. And before we let our mouse do anything, we've got to print our environment so that we can do a comparison after the simulation. It'll look pretty empty, except for some piping hot radioactive material in the center. Next, we need a while loop to run our simulation and know when to stop. In this case, we'll keep looping until our mouse has, well, scurried off this mortal coil. To implement this loop, we'll use an integer named steps to keep track of how many actions our mouse has performed. Groundbreaking, I know. And finally, after we let our rodent friend live out its radioactive life, we can print our environment again to see how far the radioactive materials have been scattered. Running a simulation, even with just one mouse, can feel really cool because it is cool! But one of the reasons we build computational models of the real world is to gather or simulate a bunch of data. We could run the program again and again and again, but that would be kind of a headache. So instead, we could just build an array list of mouse objects to see how a whole swarm of radioactive mice, or technically a mischief of mice, would affect our virtual environment. To keep with the best practices of object-oriented programming, we can write a method to help us make an array list in whatever size we want, with whatever environment object we want. That method, called getMice, will live in our program's main method. So now we can run our program again, only this time we'll use our new get mice method to fill up an array list with a bunch of mouse objects. We want to make sure that our while loop breaks and ends the simulation only after all the mice aren't alive anymore. To do that, we can add a new method named allMiceAreDead to help loop through our array list and evaluate the alive variable for each mouse object. I love a clear method name! The starting visualization of our environment will look the same, but after our radioactive mice have brought their chaos, we can see that the radiation has spread much farther. Even though these printed maps of symbols are fun to look at, our simulation is packed with lots of different data about each radioactive mouse. Just think of all the instance variables we have. So we can also extract data from our code to answer more nuanced questions about how the mice or the environment change over time. To create a CSV file, 
file for more analysis, we need the data type of all of our information to be consistent. So in the mouse class, we need to add a method to take all of our variables, which are stored as doubles, integers, or Boolean values, and return them as a list of strings separated by commas. We can actually export the CSV in our main method, because we need to be able to access that data for all of the mouse objects that got instantiated. There are multiple ways to create a CSV. This time, we'll use some new tools, the file class and the file writer class that we can import from the ever reliable Java library. And we'll make it so that each line of our CSV will represent a different mouse object. After we have our data in a spreadsheet, we have to do some of the hardest work a computer scientist can do. Make office small talk. No, I mean more thinking. And by that, I mean we need to analyze this data to learn something meaningful. We have information like the x and y coordinates of each mouse's final resting place, their total radiation exposure, and how many incremental steps that each mouse stayed alive. So, for example, it might be interesting to compare the total exposure with how long each mouse survived and create a scatter plot to look at that relationship. We can't draw any sweeping conclusions based on just one plot, but but you can see a trend here, right? With a low exposure, a mouse can live and spread radioactive material a lot longer. And this spread gives us context for how large of an area to restrict human exposure, or it might be part of a larger program simulating how all wildlife in an area spread radioactivity. Even though this one tiny analysis doesn't revolutionize how we understand radioactive mice, if we added more nuance to our model, like more complex environments, detailed math of radioactive decay, or more specific mouse behavior, you could see how this could become a really powerful program. Or a video game for people who are into watching radioactive mice run around. Sharks? Thinking back to the programs we wrote way back at the beginning of this series, it's kind of wild how far we've come. And that's a big part of the joy of programming. Once you have some basic tools and know how to look up Java libraries, you can go from hello world to radioactive mice to whatever you can dream up next. So from all of us at Study Hall, good luck experimenting and live laugh lasagna. We got it. <laughs> I can't eat cheese. If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, visit GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching.